Good afternoon. This is Campbell McCreary, uh, Amvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. live webinar with uh, Viva Gold Mines and Golden Predator Mining Corp. Um, Viva trades on the venture as VAU and VAUCF on the OTC, and Golden Predator uh, trades as GPY on the venture and NTGSF on the OTCQX. We hope you'll enjoy today's program. We also be available in replay mode. Uh, feel free to chat in your questions in the question pane of GoToWebinar or just email them in. And uh, always all important disclaimer, uh, this call is, is most definitely for informational uh, purposes only. So a uh, little special program here. We've got two CEOs and two companies, but as many of you know, they had an important announcement. So uh, Valerie, I'm gonna give you control of the presentation uh, for the two companies. And um, I'm gonna ask Jim Heskus, CEO and director of Viva Gold to turn on its webcam and Bill Sheriff, uh, chairman of Golden Predator Mining. Uh, so I'll have a joint presentation and uh, understand, uh, Bill, you're gonna kick it off. Very good. Thanks, Campbell. Thanks everyone Thank for attending. This is uh, one of our first presentations together and what we think is uh, building a, a great uh, combination company. Uh, many of you know uh, where we've been going with uh, Golden Predator working on Brewery Creek for a number of years. And uh, we, we've certainly looked forward to advancing it into production and uh, the, the combination of teams here and assets really, really builds a dynamic company. Uh, you know, the the real benefits for, for both teams of shareholders are bringing together what we have is a, a very good geologic team and, and uh, excellent strength in uh, First Nations and ESG, along with uh, similar capacities, but also the really important aspect of being able to build mines uh, with Jim's extensive background and his team as well. So you're, you're getting a strength in management and leadership team, uh, much, much better expanded uh, and combined in-house uh, mine building capacity. Uh, you know, we're responsible, we, as I mentioned, the ESG, we, we've always been a, a leader in that uh, regard and we'll continue to be with the combined entity and uh, re rededicating ourselves to that. Uh, the combination of scale is important as well. You know, single, single asset companies tend to have a discount. Uh, we have two premier assets that are both headed towards production and uh, in two, uh, two of the better uh, jurisdictions. Um, it uh, is, is highlighted by uh, you know about one and a 1.1 million ounces of, uh, of uh, resource uh, in the measured and indicated, and then another 0.7 million ounces inferred. And uh, the exploration portfolio is is equally important uh, down the road. We've got a number of advanced projects uh, that uh, uh, are very promising in, in both uh, the gold and, and silver as well as copper. And uh, the obviously the uh, balance sheet strengthens with the two companies as well. Uh, and we'll have uh, over seven million in cash uh, or equivalents when we start uh, start the, the new day with the combined company. Uh, and diversification is uh, equally important. Uh, while we're in two strong jurisdictions, the uh, the jurisdictional diversification is is a strength and uh, should should see us to uh, get to fruition a lot quicker on on both assets um, with our exposure to Nevada and the Yukon. Uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about Brewery Creek, and then Jim will talk to you in detail about the Tonopah project. Uh, just by a bit of background, uh, Jim certainly experienced with Brewery Creek as well. He was involved with it when it was operating under Viceroy in the in the early days. Uh, and uh, similarly, I was involved with this Tonopah project when I was on the board of Midway Gold. Uh, we had several projects at the time and ended up uh, going with a different one to try and put into production. But uh, the, the Tonopah project uh, was always one of my favorites to the grade and the open-ended nature of it uh, and, and the uh, proximity to infrastructure are, are phenomenal. So uh, I think both of us are really excited to be involved in the other one's projects and combining them makes uh, makes a lot of sense given given that strength of knowledge on both of them. Uh, Brewery Creek, is, as you may uh, recall, we put out a, uh, a 2020 updated mineral resource estimate. Uh, you could go back a couple, there we go. Uh, which, which showed uh, 790,000 ounces of indicated uh, leachable along with uh, almost 500,000 inferred uh, and then a, a pretty generous sulfide resource there. Uh, you know, we, we've been moving towards uh, restarting this for some time and have a feasibility study underway. I've been making all sorts of optimization uh, movements on that and, and Jim's been involved with that as well uh, from a consulting standpoint. Uh, on the Tonopah project, 
Uh, got you know uh, right at a half a million ounces. As I say, it's uh, it's going to be a very low cost operation. And uh, Nevada's number one jurisdiction in the Fraser Institute. And uh, having worked there for a number of years, I, I would certainly concur with that. No better place to be. Um, there's a reason it would be uh, probably fifth or sixth largest gold mining nation on earth if it were a standalone country. And so we're, we're glad to see that diversification. When you look at the combined company, uh, you'll see the pro forma will have 235 million shares out and uh, 270 fully diluted. But to get to that fully diluted number, it brings in an awful lot of cash. So uh, I think that's an important thing to, to pay attention to. And of course, all the uh, warrants and, and options of EVA will be converted into a golden predator at the uh, conversion ratio. Board of directors, I, I won't uh, go into a great deal of detail here, but it's certainly each, each and every one of them are, are noteworthy. And we've really increased the strength of the board by combining uh, the best of both sides. Uh, and joining me, of course, Jim, uh, who's got uh, an incredibly distinguished career, 40 years of building mines uh, all over the world, uh, not, not just uh, gold and silver, but copper, and has actually uh, built a mine in the Yukon before. So uh, that, that's a big, uh, big advance for us as well. Uh, Bill Harris, our audit chairman, has uh, uh, you know, been at sea level with a number of Fortune 500 firms, including a CEO of Hoist Fibers. He brings a lot of uh, strength in the accounting field to us. Stefan Spears. Uh, Vice President of McEwen Mining, uh, one of the young up and coming stars in the mining business, and we're certainly glad to, to have him on board. Tony Lesiak, uh, Senior Investment Advisor at Canaccord for years, as, as well as a number of other uh, firms, and, and now involved with the Royalty Company. Uh, and Chris Harold, uh, great career, uh, known him for years since Crown Resources, uh, Echo Bay, Anaconda, and now with Solitario Zinc, really making some, some big movement there. Uh, and David Whittle, I, I got to know when he was the CFO of Alexco when uh, we actually purchased the Brewery Creek mine from Alexco. So his experience in the Yukon and, and uh, his, his accounting strength really, really comes to, uh, to the front and helps build a, a quality team here. Uh, this you've probably seen before if you've seen the Golden Predator uh, presentation. So we've got 181 square mile property. You can see it at the inset at the lower right of your screen in red. The gray area around it is Trondekwichen First Nation land, and uh, uh, we we certainly work uh, with them well in the area, and are, and are glad to uh, have them as neighbors and hosts to uh, whatever we do in, in their traditional territory. We're 30 miles from the uh, international airport. There, we're along paved roads. Uh, it's it's really good infrastructure, especially for the Yukon. Uh, of that 181 square kilometers, you can see we've only explored a small portion of it, and the irregular rectangular outline of tan coloring is the uh, existing production permit area, which was originally started with Viceroy back uh, in the 96 to 2002 timeframe. Uh, the blue is the heap leach pad. I'd point out that all the mining that was done here was done uh, run a mine, so none of it was crushed. And there's still quite a bit of value left in that uh, heap leach, and that'll be included in, in the feasibility study looking at that. The areas in green are uh, primarily, uh, the central area there's uh, along a thrust fault known as the reserve trend. Uh, it's dipping to the south. Uh, this is the area that's been historically exploited. And the areas in green are in the currently permitted area. Uh, the areas in yellow are new discoveries since the permit was issued. So additional work will have to be done to bring those into the permit. And the areas in the orange stipled area are new discoveries that, uh, quite frankly, we just haven't had time to follow up on and, and drill out. But uh, uh, real, really a lot of upside there. Uh, this is what the mine uh, looked like uh, when it was going. You can see the heap leach pad that's pretty much as it is now. It was originally permitted for 10 cells. Uh, it, seven of them were built. So we've got three that are uh, designed and permitted but haven't been built. You can see the truck shop and the infrastructure uh, uh, up in the upper left of that uh, lower picture. Uh, here again, year-round access uh, is, is really great. Um, and we're only 17 kilometers from grid power, which gives us a uh, a really nice option as we move this thing into production. Uh, the mining rate under the current permits, 4 million tons a year, and uh, that uh, hopefully will be expanded as we move forward. The resource that uh, I mentioned that we'd completed in 2020, now this will be updated in the uh, current feasibility study. A significant amount of this uh, indicated and in inferred oxide will actually be moved into the, uh, uh, will actually measured resources for the first time, so that'll be something to look forward to. Most of the drilling that's been done in the most recent years has been along that reserve trend, trying to tie individual deposits into a single pit 
uh, which is obviously more efficient for mining purposes. And that uh, modeled into a pit shell during our last modeling called the keg. You can see that's where the vast majority of uh, the uh, ounces in the permitted areas are. That top block is all the permitted ounces. Um, got 264,000 indicated, another 100,000 on uh, on inferred, uh, just within that keg pit. The total up there is uh, 440,000 ounces uh, in the indicated and 179 in the inferred. I would point out the grade. Both of those grades are over 1.1 grams per ton, a uh, very good grade for open pit mining. The resources you see below are the areas that uh, in that map were uh, shown as yellow. Uh, that is resources that uh, have been drilled out. Uh, most of them are still open, at least in one direction, several of them in multiple directions, uh, but they, they have not been brought into the uh, mine plan or into the permitting area yet. Go ahead. Well, what, what are we looking forward to the rest of this year? Well, the feasibility study is well underway. Uh, it's been uh, delayed due to COVID, due to a number of uh, issues. We've got a half a dozen different contractors, and with people working uh, from home, it's certainly delayed things. Our drill program got off to a late start. Uh, we had delays on getting some of the samples in, but it's well underway, uh, and uh, so we can certainly look forward to that coming out to, uh, shortly. Yes, the submissions. We've already submitted uh, our plans for renewal of the application for the quartz mining license and water use licenses. Uh, and I would like to point out that both of these are, are fully supported by the Trend Equichen First Nation. And once again, our gratitude for them for that. Uh, be one of the primary beneficiaries of seeing this mine revitalized and moving forward. Um, baseline studies, uh, we're, we're bringing on the environmental baseline studies primarily on the new resources that are not in the permit area. Uh, but uh, you know these studies are ongoing and, and water sampling, which will come to again ongoing activities. Column leach test. This is an important thing that we started talking about um, uh, when we started just looking at uh, reprocessing the pad and looking at different crush sizes. Well, that is also part of the ongoing feasibility study. Those are well underway, and we look forward to uh, some some updated news on those uh, shortly. But they're coming along well. Now, water sampling here, again, it's an ongoing, uh, you, you never quit sampling water, but the, those programs have been going on for some time and, and will continue. And also uh, happy to report we've got Project Coordination Committee uh, with uh, Energy Mines and Resources uh, of the Yukon government. Look forward to establishing a similar uh, committee here in the near term with the Water Board. And obviously we uh, we work closely with Trendek, which end with, with which we have a, a working group as well to uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, I keep coming back to uh, our ESG and our commitment to the First Nations. Without their support and without their uh, uh, gracious welcoming in their area, we wouldn't be working there. And they've supported us for a number of years, and we look forward to a, a very progressive uh, working relationship with them over the years uh, uh, moving forward. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Jim Hesketh to uh, handle the rest of the presentation on Nevada and maybe cover anything I might have missed. All right. Hey, thanks, Bill. Yeah, um, anyway, uh, we'll talk about the uh, Tonopah project. It's located near Tonopah, Nevada. It's about 20 minutes drive uh, south of the Kinross Round Mountain mine and uh, about 20 minutes drive from the uh, town of Tonopah. So it's very centrally located and in the great mining district. Uh, we acquired this project in 2017. We acquired 100% of it. And that was from the uh, estate of Midway Gold. Uh, former explorers on this project included uh, Core Mining, Rio Ogham, Kennecott, Newmont, and Midway Gold. Uh, as part of our acquisition, we were able to renegotiate what had been a very onerous royalty structure. Uh, currently, there is a 2% NSR royalty with a 1% buyout option. Uh, previously, under Midway, there had been a 7% index uh, royalty that went to 7% at $700 gold. So that'll give you some ideas of the age of that royalty. Anyway, by restructuring that uh, royalty, we were able to take a look at the project from a very different viewpoint. Um, and that included uh, moving towards an open pit heat leach gold recovery uh, concept. Uh, there's a really extensive database of information, uh, including over 90,000 meters of drilling. So this is a well-advanced project. 
Um, and it's in Nevada, uh, one of the number one rated jurisdiction for mining in the world. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, key drivers for Tonopah. It's on the Walker Line Gold Trend. It's very mining friendly area. We own 100%. This deposit remains open for extension along trends uh, with what we view as significant expiration potential. Uh, we've completed a, uh, a preliminary economic assessment at a $1,400 gold price. And one of the unique aspects of the project is that it's got a high grade starter pit. The highest grade material in the mine plan is also the closest to surface comes to within 10 meters of surface. And that starter pit, um, the first two years of mining, essentially covers the bulk of the initial capital investment. And we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, what we're targeting for Tonopah is a uh, uh, open pit, conventional heap leach design. It'll have three stage crushing. So this is a crush leach to produce 40 to 50,000 ounces a year based on the current resource. If we find additional resources, we'll expand that target. Uh, what we see on this project is very strong leverage to gold price. Um, the pit constrained resource actually increases about 50% between $1,400 gold price and $1,600 gold price. And then you get uh, other increases as you move into the next increment of gold pricing. Uh, the other key aspect here is really good infrastructure, paved road directly to the site. And we'll cover that a little more uh, in a few minutes. Uh, next slide. So the current resource, Bill had talked about it. Uh, it's about a half million ounces of measured, indicated, and inferred. Uh, we've completed additional drilling since this estimate, so this is likely to have increased. One of the key points here is that if you look at the sensitivity to uh, um, cutoff grade, uh, uh, about 42% of the ounces are over one gram per uh, ton cutoff. Uh, so there are very high grade cores to this deposit. Let, let's move on. As you can see, uh, this is a long section of the, uh, the pit shells. The starter pit, which actually pulls at about $600 gold, contains about 2.7 million tons at 1.37 grams. And that begins uh, within 10 meters of surface. Uh, this starter pit drives very rapid uh, capital payback. And then you look at the total $1,600 uh, grade shell. That is driven primarily, uh, um, it, it's bounded on both ends by uh, a realistically uh, a lack of drilling. A lot of the historic drilling on this project was shallow. And uh, particularly on the Northwest, it didn't get down to the depth uh, that we're finding mineralization at. Um, so let's go to the next slide. PEA economics on this project. Uh, we did a base case of $1,400 gold. And then we did an alternative case at $1,600 gold. Uh, the $1,600 case produces about 50% uh, uh, more ounces of gold sold. Uh, now, when you look at the sensitivity of these cases, uh, this is, the price sensitivity in the right-hand box is based on the uh, base case, the $1,400 design. When you drive that $1,400 design to today's uh, uh, price range between $1,700 and $2,000, the payback on the project, that's recovery of the capital invested, um, drops to two years at $1,700 and one and a half years at $2,000. And that's that high grade core kicking in. Uh, that's your starter pit. So this is a very low capital risk project from that viewpoint. Total capital invested here um, on the PEA was about 58 million for the initial CapEx. 
that assumes 100% ownership of Crusher, Mindfleet, uh, et cetera. And uh, uh, the alternative case a bit higher due to some additional mining equipment. Uh, but when you take a look at it, uh, the cost structures potentially are similar to uh, what you see in uh, open pit heap leaches in Nevada. So it's right in the range. Uh, so let's move on. The, as you can see from the picture here, uh, there's no neighbors to this site. We're about uh, 20 minutes plus drive outside of town. Uh, the road in the background is the road that runs to the Round Mountain Mine. And the road that comes into the picture is a county road. It's a chip seal road. We will have to move that road. Uh, the pit will run right through it. Um, some of the key aspects, there's a water pipeline uh, that runs from Tonopah Public Utilities, plus their power line runs right across our claims. So we have access to commercial water and the, the power line is uh, Nevada Energy. Uh, that's upgradable to 25 kilovolt line. And uh, again, that'll be less than a mile from our, uh, um, where that runs, it's less than a mile from our proposed process plant site. Uh, there's equipment supply depots in Las Vegas and Round Mountain. And in 2003, Newmont, uh, former uh, explorer on the project, did complete an exploration level and environmental assessment and cultural resource studies. Uh, we've recently been updating those studies. And uh, um, uh, just this last month, we had a uh, rollout meeting with both the uh, Bureau of Land Management and um, uh, Nevada uh, Environment. Um, in regards to what we need to do for additional baseline study on the project, and they've provided us with a list. Uh, so that, that aspect of the project is moving ahead quite nicely. Let's go to the next slide. So um, really, we completed a 11-hole RC drill program in November. Uh, that has to be put into the model yet. And we've also completed a uh, series of large diameter core samples. Uh, those have also been completed. And uh, uh, it says waiting on assays. We've now received those assays and uh, uh, we're ready to start the additional metallurgical uh, optimization studies. Uh, we've completed a pre-feasibility level uh, geotechnical study for pit slopes. And uh, we need to drill a few more oriented core holes to advance at the feasibility study level. Uh, we commenced a um, periodic baseline water sampling in December, uh, and we were moving ahead. Uh, we completed archaeologic studies and moving ahead with our uh, biologic study updates. So all of that's uh, moving forward and uh, that is our work program for this year, but we are expecting to move this project into feasibility study. Uh, uh, this summer uh, would be the initiation. Oh, let's go to the next slide. Oh, these are, uh, we're gonna step back here. Uh, these are exploration projects that are in the uh, um, uh, Golden Predator portfolio. One is the Marg uh, Polymetallic uh, project. Uh, that's near Kino City in the Yukon. And this is a project that I was actually uh, uh, formerly involved in in a uh, previous company. Uh, we sold this project uh, while focusing on some others. But this is a uh, polymetallic massive sulfide with a massive metal content. Uh, this would be a project that starts in a small open pit going underground. Um, but you can see the uh, grades here, um, very rich deposit. Nobody has drilled on this project since the uh, um, uh, about 2008, I believe it is. Um, there is a uh, um, valid expiration license on this project. 
It's valid through 2027, I believe. And this could be an additional target as a third leg to a uh, two project development uh, company initially. But what I'm just pointing out here is the upsides that this merger brings to the table. It's not just the two gold projects, it's, uh, it's a pipeline of uh, opportunities moving forward. Let's go to the next slide. So we have in Golden Predator two additional exploration properties. One's Gold Dome. It's quite close to the uh, Victoria project. Um, uh, this one has a in-house uh, 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 resource on it uh, somewhere. And uh, this has a lot of opportunity. The other one is the uh, Grew Creek. This is on the road to the uh, uh, Farrow, old Farrow mine, uh, crosses the Rob, Robert Campbell Highway. There's a power line runs right through it. So these are exploration projects within uh, Golden Predator, but they're keenly located near good infrastructure, which is always important in the North Country. Um, let's go to the next slide. So what we've been pointing out here is a solid pipeline of development assets, uh, a mine building team that we're, the combination brings together, uh, the two advanced stage projects ready to go, uh, our in, increased in-house expertise to advance the projects, um, significant uh, heap leachable gold resources. What we're focused on, the low, uh, low cost technologies here, enhanced balance sheet, cost synergies through consolidation. Um, we can reduce overheads uh, by combining um, jurisdictional, diversification and risk mitigation. Uh, this helps us to offset any changes in legislation in any jurisdiction. And then a very committed focus to environmental stewardship. It's the only way you can get forward in today's world. Um, you have to be conscious of this. So the board of directors of Viva Gold, we've got a shareholder vote coming up on May 3rd. And the directors have recommended that shareholders vote in favor of the arrangement. Uh, we've received a fairness opinion to that effect. And uh, um, I believe that this uh, um, transaction is well supported. Um, anyway, uh, let's open this uh, up for questions. Excellent. Um... First of all, uh, congratulations on the synergism of this merger. Um, for shareholders of Golden Predator, how is this, uh, how is the spin-off of C2 Gold going to be handled? Well, it'll, it uh, we'll certainly will be giving them a, and I don't recall the exact number, it's, it's in the uh, materials, but uh, right now Golden Predator is a controlling shareholder uh, in the regulatory definition of C2C. And that requires a, a additional accounting burden, et cetera, to be consolidated into our financial statements. So uh, at, at the time of the merger, prior to the, the merger, uh, a portion of those shares will be dividended out to each of the Golden Predator shareholders uh, as a return of capital, which will take uh, Golden Predator, the ongoing merged company's ownership in C2C down to below 10%. Uh, is the uh, Seabridge asset still on the balance sheet? The Seabridge asset is. Uh, it's a significant part of the uh, cash and equivalents on the balance sheet, and it has been generating income through uh, a covered options writing program as well, which has uh, helped to uh, offset the, the GNA of the company. Um, how many jobs will Brewery Creek support during construction and operation? How many of those jobs are expected to be occupied? Uh, by First Nations uh, employees. 
I'm going to take the, the last half of that first and then turn it over to Jim because he's probably got a better idea from the engineering and mining standpoint as to the, the you know, personnel uh, numbers. But, uh, I, you know, historically in operation, there have been 50 percent of the uh, jobs held by the First Nations. And, you know, the Dawson City is one of the very best places in the north to, to have a mine and that we've got a skilled workforce that's, uh, you know, familiar with mining, familiar with uh, open pit. In fact, a significant number of the folks that worked there, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago are still in the area and have expressed a great deal of interest in, in coming on board. But Jim, you might uh, better be able to talk about numbers of construction and full time. Yeah, and in, in operation, the project would probably have somewhere between uh, um, 130 and uh, 150 employees and contractors. Um, in construction, that's likely to balloon up for periods, but that's uh, the shorter term employment. Uh, so, you know, that's going to be key there. Uh, and like Bill says, uh, Dawson, I, I've lived in the Yukon in the past. I built mine there in the 80s. And what you tend to find is people who are very, uh, um, they, they understand building, they understand machinery and getting good work done. And that was my experience back then. And uh, I suspect it's pretty much the same today. It, it's the type of environment where you can really get good construction completed. It is. And the one thing I'd add on to that is it's uh, probably one of the few mine sites in uh, the Yukon where uh, workers can actually live at home uh, because the mine is so close to the community. Um, what is involved with the water license and quartz mining license renewal for Brewery Creek? Um, any comment on uh, the, the status of uh, licensing and, and the, the road ahead? Well, on, a, on a high level, the, we have to put in uh, plans of operation and uh, detail a number. I'm not the permitting expert, but detail a number of different parameters of, of the ongoing operation. And uh, then it's uh, reviewed and, and moved on from there. But they, they have been submitted. Yeah, the, the process is very, very similar to what we do in the US for the EA EIS process. Um, very little um, difference. But these are renewals, they're not, uh, these are not brand new licenses. So. Uh, moving to Tonopah, how much? Money have you spent at Tonopah? Well, uh, as Viva, we've spent about five million. Uh, but uh, um, over over time, with all the companies involved, it's got to be closer to uh, uh, twenty to thirty million. Um, do you think? investors should focus on discounting the cash flows of potential future production or should the focus be on relative uh, EV to resource valuation at this point and the potential to increase resources at both projects? Uh, will the merger change the original time frames for either project? Interested in your thoughts on valuation? That's a big question. Maybe you each kind of jump at it we'll take a first crack at it i mean you know the investor uh, view is is you know in the in the beholder's eye i personally think it takes a hybrid view of evaluation uh, you've got two assets that are lined up for production uh, in very favorable uh, areas uh, that i think the timeline in general will be hastened by the the strengthening of the, of the team uh, bringing the team together here and bringing jim's leadership in um you know, that, that being said, uh, Jim touched on a couple of exploration points. So what you've got here is really a dynamic uh, small company that, uh, you know, has, has some real ability to become a, a mid-sized company through, uh, through organic growth and development of its existing resources and bringing up some of those exploration assets. So I think really, you know, there's a little bit of something for everyone, but I think the true value of the company is going to have to be a hybrid uh, view of, of all of those factors taken together. Yeah, and I would have to agree with that. The, uh, you know, when you look at the potential mergers, you don't look at the way things are today. You have to look at them as to what you can build from the combination. 
one plus one equals three or four. So that's really the dynamics you're trying to create. And that flows very heavily into how you value the concept. So it goes beyond a spreadsheet analysis. Uh, you know, there's a lot of intangibles that we're bringing to the table here and we can turn into tangible value. All right, Stu. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, guys. Um, did you have to get any shareholder pre-bid acceptances before announcing the deal? Uh, not, not before announcing it. Obviously, uh, you know, we we'd approached uh, with the concept uh, to to our bigger shareholders on both sides of the equation, yeah. um, on, on a conceptual basis, but uh, not not prior to uh, coming, you know, to to the agreement and then turning it over to valuation committees and outside of uh, opinions and that sort of thing. Then, then obviously shareholder vote on on Viva. Yeah, and then what is the percentage of shareholders needing you need? To approve this is it like two thirds or seventy percent? Well, for Viva Gold, it's two thirds of the votes cast. Yep. Yep. Got it. Um, and what would be your response to push back on the fact that both companies are you know in development and need capital versus other companies have or producing assets have acquired development assets to use that? production cash flow to fund the capex burden well the the real burden here is going to be to put the first mine into production you don't build them simultaneously um so the first the first uh, uh mine that uh receives uh final permits and uh it, financing is the one that gets built first uh, uh and then you leverage that first mine into the second mine, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it needs to be a well thought out in um, development concept, but let's put it this way. You have more assets to pledge with multiple, with a multiple asset company than you do with a single asset company. So it, that's a strengthening by itself. Yeah, that's true. For sure, I didn't think about the extra security in it. Um, the all aging kinetics of both deposits, how could you talk about them and you know the met metallurgical understanding of both deposits? Can you say that again, please? So, um, how do the all aging kinetics of brewery and Tonopah vary from each other? And which projects metallurgical tests are more advanced? Um, well, brewery, of course, because it's been an operating mine. So there's a there's a massive amount of data to rely upon. Mm -hmm. um, we're still doing optimization test work for Tonopah. We need to do additional work there. Um, you know, the leech the leech uh, kinetics in the Tonopah district are very well understood, though we're in the same rock packages and lithologies as the round mountain mine up the road from us uh, so there is you know a lot of background knowledge but every ore body is different so you have to apply uh you know individual uh testing to that yep and then in terms of plans for expiration this year how are you approaching you know splitting a budget on expiration across you know, brewery and Tonopah, or what would be more of a focus on the exploration front? Well, I think, uh, um, you know, we we still need to bring these companies together and we'll be appraising uh, how the uh, funding will be uh, uh, settled. Uh, we do need to do some core things at uh, Tonopah, including uh, geotechnical drilling to uh, uh, keep keep the project moving forward. Uh, so most of the drilling this year, I believe, in both Tonopah and Brewery, will be focused on probably converting inferred to measured and indicated. Mm -hmm. it, it, fair enough, Bill, or? 
Yeah, no, I would I would totally agree. I mean, we we don't need to go out and strike out on uh, new exploration projects when we have two that are uh, really in a race for the finish line on production. It's it's a bit of a horse race with the two projects, and uh, you know I think most of the money, uh, if not all of it, will be spent in uh, furthering those uh, towards the uh, you know finish line and cash flow. Once once you've got the cash flow being generated internally, then you can. Uh, have the luxury of uh, taking the uh, exploration projects and, and really bringing them up to speed as well. And of course, advancing the other uh, primary asset into production. Yep. And then I guess on that, can you go through the project development timetable of the combined company? Well, that is really driven uh, by the final issuance of these permits. Uh, and, you know, Tonopah, we need to move it through feasibility. Uh, that'll be a, probably about a six month process. So Tonopah is a little bit behind brewery when it comes to that. Uh, so, you know, what we've got with the two projects moving forward simultaneously is that we can accept some hiccups on one or the other uh, and be pushing forward on the one that doesn't have the hiccups. So that's really a key. Uh, again, it's a horse race. Yep. And then someone said in a question, how are you thinking about financing the two projects with equity versus debt? Well, well I think that's gonna depend largely on where we are in the market as well. And uh, you know, we've got a certainly got enough in-house resources now to get both through feasibility and and uh uh, you know, through through a good portion, if not all the permitting. So I, I think, you know, you're uh, going to depend upon the buoyancy of the market, the price of gold, uh, lots, lots of trade-offs at that point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you get to the construction phase, certainly some component of that, usually between 60 and 70 is conventional debt. How you, how you finance the uh, uh, equity component, it's highly dependent on, again, as Bill says, what the market looks like. Uh, my last mine, uh, the Briggs mine in California, we financed it uh, to a large extent by selling a gold bond on future production. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities uh, to finance depending on what the markets look like at the time. Yeah, I would just add that you know if you're looking at a incredibly low uh, low to no interest rate environment that we're in now, then obviously debt's far more appealing than uh, than a lot of the other alternatives. But here again, you've got to you know it's it's hard to say that's where you're going to be in a year from now or, or whatever time frame you're looking at. So it's going to be a decision for, decision for the board at the time, but there'll be a lot of options. Yep, yeah, thanks for that, Campbell. Always uh, doing. Hey, you're mute. We were hearing more about MARG, which may be a hidden gem in the portfolio. Is this something that you would be more interested in advancing and monetizing by selling to a base metals oriented producer? Or are there advantages to becoming a polymetallic versus a pure play uh, precious metals company? So who has MARG? MARG. Well, it's it's been our project, and I'd point out that while it's got a you know a huge, it is a polymetallic, it's still got well over a half a gram uh, and over 30 gram of gold and 30 grams of silver. So it uh, you know it's it's not uh, you know a base metal project. It's truly polymetallic with a very significant uh, precious metal credit. And Jim, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Marg is Marg is a gem. Uh, it. it was formerly explored by a company I ran, uh, Atna Resources. And, uh, you know, I'm a strong believer that uh, that could be a third leg to the stool here. Um, so, you know, we're gonna take a good hard look at that, uh, both internally and its external value. And having a little copper in a gold company uh, never hurts. Just ask uh, Barrick and Newmont. Um, if brewery got permitted first, what kind of delay would that put on Tonopah? So how, how are we going to manage uh, these two projects, flagship properties in, in wildly different places? Well, in, in today's world, I don't see too many difficulties uh, 
Um, there's excellent communications in the Yukon as well as uh, in Nevada. Um, so I don't see the difficulties in managing them uh, as units. Uh, in terms of the delays on Tonopah vis-a-vis the brewery, well, which one comes first is the question. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, if you're building one project, you are likely to delay the other one. Um, but that's what having a pipeline of assets is about. And you try to accelerate them as fast as you can. Uh, that's, that's just good management. Okay. Um, how would you comment on the increasing exploration activity on the Walker trend? Where does Tonopah stand when we look at the peers at uh, the Walker trend? And, um, and in, you know, lots of things going on in Tonopah too. So maybe comment on some of that. Well, you know, there is uh, some increased exploration in the Walker Lane trend. Uh, some of that's driven by the uh, uh, now controlled ownership of the autoclaves uh, in Nevada. So it makes uh, Carlin systems a little less attractive. Walker Lane is mainly uh, epithermal systems. Uh, so you've got a lot of factors that come into play there. Uh, you know, Walker Line is better juniors territory than uh, um, the Carlin uh, belts at this point. So that's a big driver there. Uh, you know, it's, that, that's kind of a bit of an open-ended question. Uh, but we, we do see the expiration upside on the Tonopah project, uh, but it's going to require uh, Outside of the core deposit, uh, it's going to require more of a uh, fully focused exploration type effort to uh, uh, really release that uh, potential. Um, mm -hmm. I believe personally that the biggest upside on Tonopah is opening the deposit up because that's going to tell you exactly which directions to take your, your drilling in. And uh, at, well, most uh, explorationists won't agree with this statement. More ore is found by miners than has ever been found by explorationists. <laughs> That's true. You can see that in most of the Nevada mines have continued on three and four times their original uh, reserve estimate uh, and, and continue to continue to produce. Uh, I've, I've got one other minor point on the Walker Lane situation. I mean, the amount of money in the last 50 years spent in exploration in Nevada is, uh, you know, Walker Lane's almost been an afterthought compared to uh, the Carlin trend and the Battle Mountain trend. And so you, you simply have not got the advanced level of exploration along the Walker Lane that you've had along the other two primary trends. So I, I think it leaves a lot of potential there. And uh, you know, it's certainly not without some major mines. Round Mountain's one of the you know, real behemoths in, in, the, in the state or, or even in, in the world if you look at it that way. And uh, certainly Rawhide and uh, Candelaria were both uh, very big uh, mines. You can go on and on uh, with the ones that have been there, but it just has never received the focus in modern times that uh, Carlin Trend and Battle Mountain have. And, you know, largely because of the budgets that uh, Newmont and Berwick and, and prior to that Placer Dome, some of the others had, had really put into those areas. So it, it, you're going to see more discoveries down there, and you're certainly going to see uh, – you know, the trend continue where you see existing uh, discoveries turned into mines and, and have them, you know, exceed their planned mine life by two, three, four, five times. So I, I don't see uh, any, any difference other than where we are in the uh, amount of money spent uh, to develop mines in the history of the state. So you'll, you'll definitely see that uh, improve. Yeah. Very good. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and when you uh log out please uh share a few lines of your feedback it'll get to to jim and bill uh, in short order um and we play will be available uh in about an hour and uh you can get an advance uh viewing at ambestcapital.com slash replays and um with that uh i'll leave it to the two of you to to close and uh maybe we can uh uh, kind of summarize uh, 
why why buy now? What uh, what's on the horizon in in the near to? Well, thanks, thanks, Campbell and Stuart, uh, for the opportunity, first off. And uh, secondly, I, I think the most compelling uh, observations, aside from the fact that the market's been in a slump on gold and we appear to have put a bottom in, I think that's a very important factor. But uh, no longer are either company a, a one-trick pony, if you will, a, a one major asset uh, company going forward. And it clearly is an opportunity to get in on the uh, new ground floor, if you will, of a one plus one equals three or four. And uh, I think that combining the teams and the properties is, is compelling on its own. And when you review the, the statistics and the numbers on them it, it, uh, and the background of the individuals, especially Jim's uh, background on mining, it becomes quite compelling. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. And I would like to uh, also thank everybody for attending today. Um, I think it's been a uh, good discussion. And I'd like to... Uh, um, recommend to all uh, Viva shareholders who are on the call. Um, the board has uh, recommended in favor of uh, voting for this arrangement. And uh, I'd like all of you, to, I'd like to encourage all of you to uh, um, vote your shares. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Thanks.